introduce our next speaker. There were two sources that um, I wanted to point out um, before we went to break. And the first is uh, for the gentleman, he may have left already, um, who was from Chicago, a really good source to really, th to really help you think about um, uh, the problems with segregation and racism or whatever in the North, um, is a book that I often have my students read called Sweet Land of Liberty, The Forgotten Struggle for Civil Rights in the North. Um, it's about this thick and the print is really small, but it's a really uh, very interesting and informative book um, that really lets us know that a lot of the struggles that Southerners have also occurred in the North. And in fact, when I use it to teach my classes, I really emphasize that we're not just talking about a Southern problem, we're actually talking about a nationwide issue. Um, and the other source that really blows my students' minds away, particularly those who were born and raised in Arkansas, um, is an article that I have them read that talks about the 200,000 African Americans who moved to Arkansas between 1890 and the years before and during World War I. And that article is by a colleague of mine at the University of Central Arkansas, uh, Dr. Story McEnron, and it's entitled The Great Negro State of the Country, Arkansas's Reconstruction and the Other Great Migration. So I just thought about these when someone was talking about migration out of Arkansas to the north, and it just you know occurred to me to, say, to, to, to tell you that, well, 200,000 people came to Arkansas because they found opportunity here. Um, anyway, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Elmer Beard. Uh, known as the political griot of the spa city, Elmer Beard is a retired elected official with more than 50 years of community service and civic leadership. He is also a civil rights champion with a long career of fighting for equality for residents in Hot Springs, Arkansas. In the 1960s, he helped students prepare for integration and challenge local businesses to hire black employees. He is an author, a poet, and he's also working on a three-volume set of poetry. Most recently, he self-published his first book, The Challengers, Untold Stories of African Americans Who Changed the System in One Small Southern Municipality. This book was a two-time recipient of the Arkansas Black Hall of, uh, the Arkansas Black History Commission's Curtis H. Sykes Memori Memorial Grant Program. Program. He will present highlights from his career um, and this groundbreaking project. Please welcome Mr. Elmer Beard. Good morning and thank you so very much to all that have spoken before me and all the recognition that have been given for this occasion and this day. Uh, if I had to remember one name, it would be Tiana, and she said that I was free to call her T. We've seemingly been working together for about two years in my effort to get uh, necessary funding for my project. The challenges, you have the uh, photo here of the uh, front of the book and we have it uh, note of the poster about the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, Unit 6013 of Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was from that NACP Unit 6013 that a committee was organized and from that committee, we came up with the challenges here. I am here to follow the direction of my daughter, who's supposed to be an expert in the area of keeping me limited and on track and not digressing, because I have such a great time when I digress. But I, I try not to have as much fun with it today, because I have some special notes and some special people that I want to share with you. Now, we are talking today in the challenges about 63 African-American candidates Pointed to public office, elected to public office, they ran, they lost, they won. All 63 from 1954 to 2010. And if I happen to mention that several times, it's because I've been living this since 1999. So someone say, why such a tiny little book like this take you so long to compose Elmer Beard? I know you're involved in ACP and it points out some 50 years experience in civil rights in my community. And my quick answer is family first. In the book, and I don't always autograph it on the first blank page, I autograph it under the name of my two late wives. Uh, from my first wife, we have three children, one daughter is here shelfing around me now and keeping me in line. And the other daughter uh, is in New York where she is concerned about the results of today. But, uh, this book presents uh, profiles of these 63 candidates. I am one of them. I'll try to keep the report or highlights about the book in a third person. I don't remember writing a book or, 
I'm sorry, reading the book before where the author of the book wrote it in the third person, but I was trying to stay out of it and I wanted to be open and honest. And some of the people who have read it have also observed that um, I tried to say something positive about everybody who was involved and uh, whether they won or lost and ran for public office. So I have uh, an introduction that I want to read because without reading that introduction of the challenges and some of them over here to my left, at this fresh table, you will not have the kind of questions that I want you to have at the end of my uh, presentation. The introduction goes like this, and uh, before I finish with it, I will probably begin digressing and, and simply narrating because it is important that you do know. So let me just do that. From the 19th century throughout World War II, nearly all of the public officials in the city of Hot Springs, Arkansas had been white. The tone has been set for me to say that freely, and I'm very proud of the speaker who is before me. There are reports of two black men, Jackson D. Page and uh, J.H. Golan, elected to the city council April 5th, 1896, to the, according to the record, in a yearbook from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Another exception, though scarcely documented, was a black man named J.H. Carr. Little is known about Carr and his tenure as a judge in the late 1890s or the early 1900s. Some even question if Carr was a fair-skinned black man in the early 1960s, a man by the name of Theodore Page said that that's why he was able to get that position because he did pass for white. And we have a very little information like this in writing, but the Arkansas citizen at that time by Kenneth A. Dare did make note of this. In the African-American oral tradition, however, there was always word of mouth to preserve the black history. The challenges, the book that I'm sharing with you now, uh, right now is untold stories of African-Americans who changed the system in one small municipality. The way that simply was done is this, and if, I, if you feel I'm digressing, so am I. In 1954, we had no African-Americans on the city council. But you do know the significance of that year. So there was a man by the name of Fred Martin. There was also another man by the name of Clifford Martin. Fred Martin was black. Clifford Martin was white. We've had Brown versus the Board of Education to be on May 17, 1954 at 1, 1.30 p.m. in Washington, D.C. That set the stage for Fred Martin to run for public office. Fred Martin ran. Clifford Martin ran. Fred Martin ran for Alderman in Ward 5. Clifford runs for Alderman in Ward 7. Since the system, and the system is explained in the book and has three different definitions, I'm trying not to digress here, but since the system was so acclimated, so accustomed to whites only running for public office, when Fred Martin filed, white folks confused him. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. They voted for Fred Martin rather than Clifton Martin, and Fred Martin received about 300 more votes than Clifton Martin. And on the day after the election, Wednesday, I believe it was uh, November 3rd, 1954, there was a group of whites who strove into the county courthouse office and demanded that their votes be changed. Their votes were not changed, and they, they, it was declined, and Fred Martin remained in public office for two years. So someone is sitting, or maybe not sitting here, who said that, well, they knew what they were doing. They did not know what they were doing, and uh, they did the right thing at this particular time. And Fred Martin remained two years in that position. Did he run for re-election? Yes, he did. Did he lose? Yes, he did. Did he run again? Yes, he did. And again and again. He ran four times, but he won once. Now, I'm not going to be able to follow my daughter's advice by going to the next page and telling you about anyone in particular. I have to continue with this story about African Americans in the city of Hot Springs between 1954 and 1969 and 70. They protested. They did. I wasn't there. I became involved in 69 and standing here today on the backs of those who protest before I did. How did they protest? They simply filed for public office. Fifteen African Americans, including Fred Martin, filed again and again and again. One filed as many as eight times before we won. Running for public office, not throwing in the bricks, not being vulgar, vulgar in any way, destroying anybody's property. But what they were trying to say, and I'm shifting here into the system that we had, they were trying to say that we cannot win in a system where you have 
citywide voting, eight wards, blacks about 10, 12, 15, or 20 percent, and the line going through the wards to the extent that blacks cannot be elected because they can't vote for themselves. So what we had to do, and I put use the pronoun we here, we had to protest after 15 years to get the city to reapportion the ward. Well, when you start to talk and you get appointed to committees or commissions, so Elmer Beard and I am he, uh, was appointed to the reapportion commission and we worked in 1969 and 70 to get the wards reapportioned. And after we had the wards reapportioned, reduced from 16 autumn to 12 autumn from eight wards to six wards, I was able to get elected. I was re-elected seven times. I served eight terms, total of 15 years, five months, 20 days, and 30 minutes. <laughs> I kind of waited for you to do that so I could get my breath. I am. <laughs> and I didn't bring my water up with me. It's over there on the table. I, I am indebted to the city of Hot Spring, the state of Arkansas, the uh, Arkansas Municipal League, and the uh, area of the state government from where I get my uh, check each month. Thank you so much. I'm indebted to Hot Springs and the state of Arkansas that I have a salary that's going to be here until I go, uh, not standing right here until I leave this earth. <laughs> and uh, I feel indebted uh, to Hot Springs and the state of Arkansas as being one of the elected officials that came out of the time when there were so much strife and was able to remain relatively clean. There was a millionaire, former mayor, who said to her granddaughter, and we're the same age, by the way, we're on the eve of 80, both of us. She said to her granddaughter, I want you to meet Elma Beard. And I don't like to talk about myself, but you won't believe that before I finish. <laughs> she said, here's a man I want you to meet because uh, we have been looking for some dirt on him for decades, and we haven't found it yet. And then I was able to identify myself, an individual from many other of the elected officials that we have had and uh, we were neighbors say that about. If I may, I will go on and follow my daughter's advice and talk to you about uh, at large voting. And I come back to myself at another time. And it's on page 121 in my book. And why I say that to you, you don't have one. I don't know. I just follow my daughter's advice here. <laughs> yeah. What I want to say about uh, at large voting is, is that everybody in the city of Hot Springs at that time was voting at large. Uh, you could live anywhere and could vote, file for public office in any area of the city, and you could win. And that's what had happened between 1921 to 1970 when we were involved in this petition to change the uh, way of voting. So uh, basically, that was a great concern. The positions you could pull for, A or B or one or two, and the highest two vote getters were the winners. But when you're running citywide, when you're running citywide, everybody in the city can vote for two people citywide. Of course, that is quite different from the at-large, one man, one vote system in which I was elected for. I want to talk about one person in the book, and I, I'll slow down here. His name was Kenneth Adair. He would be the father of civil rights in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I, as I turn to page 121, I want to make a comment about him that otherwise would not have made. And that is, many people like Daisy Bates and Kenneth Adair were married to their work. Kenneth Adair uh, was not the parent of children and he didn't have a long family history in the city of Hot Springs. And because of that, he was always committed to his work. This is what I want to say about uh, Kenneth Adair. He was a civil rights leader. He was, uh, he was an author. He was very much committed to his work. And I pointed out that he was, uh, uh, he, he lived with it. Uh, he was a civil rights journalist. 
On the first night of the city council when Kenneth Adair was elected, and I was there two years before he was, because he had run as a Republican, by the way, in the 1970s for state representatives against Ray Smith. Ray Smith defeated in 13,000 to 4,000, but Kenneth Adair became very popular after that. And I shared this with African Americans in the Hot Springs community, and they didn't know they had voted the Republican for Kenneth Adair because I was a historian. I was keeping record for the last 40 years on it, and I knew what happened. Kenneth Adair suggested that uh, females in the county jail for the first time in the history of Hot Spring would be cared for by a matron. This was in the records of the audience of the city of Hot Spring. City of Hot Springs in 1970 had never had a matron, and he recommended that to the city council that night when he first came uh, as an alderman as he sat there with me. I had sat there for two years, but I was trying to get $725,000 worth of work done in the district where I live, and it took three terms to do that. I want to make another point about Kenny Thayer, even without reading it. On the first night when we were at the city council, uh, there was a resolution passed, 10 to 2, uh, adopting the death penalty. Kenneth Adair and I, without even having a meeting and agreeing that the blacker you are, the sooner you die, oh, oh, oh yellow is waiting for you, and we opposed the death penalty that first night when Kenneth Adair was our uh, alderman and uh, when we first uh, took the oath of office and started serving there in, uh, in Hot Springs. The matter of the reapportionment com reapportion committee that I want to make note of was very important for all of these things to take place that I'm mentioning uh, here tonight. Uh, when I was appointed, it was a way to get me deeply involved and I want to point out there's something about speaking out, being involved in committees, being chair of a committee. It, it gets you into leadership position that you may never know that you're getting yourself into. And that's exactly what happened to Elma Beard. Because I lived in an area where I was concerned about the neighborhood, and there were others in that same area who could not vote or run for that particular office because of the lining or the realigning of the ward. So I was able to do that, and as a result of that, I was appointed to the reapportionment committee. The reapportionment committee involved a Republican chairperson who was not on the committee. He was just simply chair, and he was an attorney at law, and that was the chairman of the Democratic Party and the chairman of the Republican Party, and one African-American, I was that person. So we redrew the lines, doing whatever it took, germanning if it became necessary for me to get elected, and I pointed out how long I stayed there, so I feel indebted to uh, to the uh, city of Hot Springs for that and happened. I do want to read one quote about Kenneth Thayer, and it so happened that Elmer Beard made the quote, Adair's fight for civil rights. The people's fight of Kenneth Adair always sided with the marginalized residents of, a, of society. With, with the history of racism in America, Adair declared that he was always right in the fight for civil rights and human rights, even if he was wrong. Adair defended the downtrodden with or without all the facts against cases of police brutality and various other forms of injustice. Even his haters in the media respected him. Well, I had to be very, very careful because I needed his support. And if I didn't agree with him, I couldn't tell him. You see, he was the father of civil rights and he was married to it. And I had a wife and three children. I had to stay with my family. Uh, they did come first. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth is gone now, has no relatives around, but I still have uh, children uh, who said that they are taking care of me. And I think sometimes it's, it's reversed, but we have a good time together. And uh, that, that's very important that when you become a senior that you have someone to take care of you. So I point that out because I want my daughter to wake me up in my sleep uh, disorder during the night when I have those. And uh, she is here to do that. We talk in the book about being drafted for public office. The word drafted is not quite often used when we are soliciting people to run for public office. Recently, we had a president of the United States who have served eight years. He was drafted. I don't know whether you've read that or where you got that information from. Some of you may or may not have it. But when someone solicits you, they urge you, they 
tell you that you can do it. You can do it. This is the right timing. You don't need to wait eight years. Eight years from now, that's what's told President Obama. Eight years from now, you have this in your record, you have that in your record, and there'll be so much on you, you have to defend it. And right now, you're green and young, and you don't have much experience, so this is time for you to go. So he was drafted. I was drafted. I lived in the right area at the right time, and the real portion of the chairperson said, if you don't run, who's going to run? I said, I just got here. Said, that's a good thing. They don't know much about you. Said, that's a good thing, too. <laughs> uh, uh, you would listen yourself as a Christian and a gentleman and an educator. All of that's good. Don't let them know too much about you. But the second time you run, it would be different. Yeah. They, they will know you very well. So I was drafted. The story about a person in the book that uh, is not in my notes, and I have to tell this. His name was Aaron Garden, and he said, served on the uh, board of directors of the city of Hot Springs. Well, after he wasn't on the board again, the, the committee on the uh, Demo Central Democratic Committee said, we need an African American to run for school board. Get up and, and make the necessary move. Who's running? So Gordon was available, but he wasn't uh, committed to running. So he was coming home from work one afternoon. He saw these signs along Central Avenue where people were passing, going down the street to the racetrack. And he saw his name out there where he was running for school board. And, uh, <laughs> He shared that with me, and I know it's been recorded, so it, 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 that, that is the truth. And he had to go home and tell his wife, say, I'm running for school board, but I didn't know it. Now let me get ready. That's, a, that's an example of being drafted. And for many of our candidates, they are drafted in that manner. One candidate, Margaret Martin I, want to, uh, Martin, I want to make a note about. She was lived to be 101. She ran for board of directors, school board, and uh, justice of the peace. Uh, it is public record, and I had reservations sitting there a few moments ago as to whether I share all these things. Martin had become elderly and had voted absentee. It's just public record, so I know it's being recorded. And then when election time came, she had forgot that she had voted. <laughs> so she voted again <laughs> and made the headlines the day after she lost in the election. But uh, that's what happened when you are very committed to your work. Margaret and I ran for different positions on the board of directors. and. As a candidate for public office, all those times I ran, by the way, it was 14 that I did run. Uh, 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 Justice Peace, mayor four times, an uh, alderman uh, eight times. In the midst of that, Margaret and I was running, and I had 13 or 14 posters in my yard. She came by and looked and said, Elma Beer, where's my poster? I said, your poster's in the middle in the front. She said, no, it's not on the second row. She went in my yard and moved the poster from the center and to the front and center, and she taught me a lesson. And I always gave her the first choice of being exposed in my yard when I was campaigning. I, I shouldn't have been campaigning. But I thought that was uh, relevant to some of the 63 candidates that ran for public office. Now, more than the candidates that ran for public office in Hot Spring, there were organizations like the Council for the Liberation of Black. Club. John Pascoe was the president of it, and along about 1969, when we were trying to get certain things done in Hot Springs, there was a group organized in a dingy beer drinking bar on Malvin Avenue, and uh, they came together on the night of uh, Miss Arkansas Pageant. And Miss Arkansas Pageant was Lily White. And John Pascoe gathered together, or they followed him into uh, the convention center, and there were about two or three hundred youngsters there. I was around keeping the young teenagers in line, and John said, well, you know, we don't have any blacks in this pageant, and so I'm announcing to this group tonight, the media was there, that don't come back next year unless you have a black in the pageant. I thought that was very interesting, because next year there was a black in the pageant, and next year that black did win Miss Hot Springs. We point that out in our book, and I thought it was a very interesting factor. But as I near the conclusion so that I allow you time for your question, there were other major factors in the civil rights struggle of Hot Springs from people who did not run for public office. One of them name was James Donald Rice, who was a pastor of the 149-year-old Roanoke Baptist Church in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And it was he, James Donald Rice, president of NACP back in 1963 when I came to Hot Springs, who had been warned by segregationists to discontinue his work as leader of the NAACP and troublemaking activities in Hot Springs. He was told, this is public record, he shared this after about uh, 
20 years after he left Hot Spring, that uh, something could happen to him, but he didn't pay it any attention. So on the night before Christmas, three nights before Christmas, no, uh, December 22nd, 1963, he was at home lying in bed at 4.45 in the morning, the phone rang, and he answered the phone. Someone said to him, we have warned you about your troublemaking NAACP activities in Hot Spring. We've asked you to discontinue it. Now look out the door and see what you see. Your church is on fire. So he said, would you repeat that so I can get it clear for clarity? And he reached the, the, the person, he reached the phone to his wife and the person repeated that. And that's a story in itself about what happened in Hot Springs. Now I shouldn't leave you with that information without sharing with you that James Donald Rice, the president of NACP, moved at that time to the church where it burned. Smoke went up and ashes went down and people gathered around at 4.45 in the morning. And three blocks away, there was a the fire department. There was a gentleman who didn't look like James Donald Rice who was black. This gentleman was white. He ran in four inches of snow. He found the door open on the back side of the church. He found the cushions piled in the church, soaked in kerosene, and it set on fire. And he told Reverend Rice, said that, never repeat this using my name. And Rice repeated it many years later, but he never used his name. The fireman kept his job. The church burned down. But that's the price of progress. Freedom is not free. It never was. It never will be. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions that we have time for. You mentioned there was a church burning. What was the name of that church? Red Oak Baptist Church, founded by ex-slaves and friends, uh, fourth Sunday in February 1868. I'm an officer of that church. Question. Elma, one of the things in going back looking at people who were early pioneers in running for office or any other leadership, they were either very, very fair or they were very, very dark. In your research, and I looked through your book, that that's not, most of them are brown or dark. What impact did you find that the coloration of your skin had an advantage or a disadvantage as it related to the acceptance by people of the white race? My research proved that it wasn't a major factor because there was a Miss Hot Springs who was a very dark skin, and she probably couldn't have won a pageant in Hot Springs, but she had a voice of contralto quality, and it enabled her to sing, and it's in the book, and I won't try to remember what the song was, and she won. There were other light-skinned people like Kenneth Adair who uh, was accepted and made pe people comfortable when he ran for public office. But I do not find that as a, as a major factor because at the time that this research was taking place, it was about the quality of the uh, research and the quality of the presentation and the uh, items uh, and material that the candidate for public office had to offer. I hope that answered. I'm ready for two or three more questions before we get ready for our appetite. Um, in, in, your, in your experience and your research, um, did you ever come across any documentation of these pioneers needing um, armed protection, like the Deacons for Defense in Hot Springs? Uh, Reverend James Donald Rice was offered protection. He did not want protection. Reverend James Donald Rice did not want to carry a gun. He didn't own a gun. Uh, the vice president, according to what I understand, uh, did have a very, very big gun. And, and uh, the president told him this is a civil rights organization. We can't have that. Uh, he retained his gun, but he was also moved from the church where he passed it to another church nearby for his own safety. I hope that kind of answers your question. I see another question in the back. I'd rather answer questions than actually review the book. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Beard, I was curious about uh, the role of women's organizations in any kind of political activism in Hot Springs. In Hot Springs, there was a sister organization to the Council of Liberation of the Black. The organization was headed by the wife of John Pascoe, who is the president of the uh, Council of Liberation of Black. They were supportive. They did influence, and uh, it was very important that we had their support when we were campaigning and running for public office and winning uh, during the 60s, preparing me for where I am now. Sir, thank you for your service. Uh, regarding the number of blacks in elected positions in Hot Springs, has that uh, decreased, increased, or stayed about the same? The number has decreased at a result of the city of Hot Springs now being under the uh, city manager, board of directors, form of government, where they are not served, and I voted against it each time. Uh, we have one member of the board of directors uh, from the African-American community, whereas we had uh, two uh, aldermen. So the number has decreased, and that's a factor in it now. I see a hand here. Some question back here, please. Good morning, Mr. Beard. Good morning, sir. How you doing? I'm excellent now that you have a good question for me. Good. Uh, I'm from West Memphis, Arkansas. And we find that the biggest problem that we face today is from other black people sabotaging our efforts to bring about equal justice. Uh, was that a problem for you guys back in the, in the time that you're just picking up? Probably so to the extent that we were scholarly or God-fearing enough to forgive and to avoid it and to keep going. And even in 2017, as I stand here today, I am able to aid in solving a lot of those problems by sometimes just stopping and say, could we have a moment of silent prayer, please? <laughs> I'm not making this up. It worked last Saturday in an NAACP meeting. It did work. It still will work. We must be reminded that these positions are bigger than we are. They will be around when we are gone. I'm aware of that. We shouldn't attempt to make a political position a career. It won't happen. Of course, I did pretty well. I've been drawing a salary since 99 from being an elected official. Uh, it's public record. That's why I share it with you. Another question? Good afternoon, morning. I am excited. Thank you so much for everything that you have shared with us today. Again, my name is Agnolia Gay. I'm an educator in the Little Rock School District. I've been talking to my students about um, all I know about black history. And today you have shared a lot of information about Arkansas history for me. And I appreciate that. Things that I never knew. And I ain't going to tell you how old I am. But you don't have to do that. But what I do know is that there are lessons to be learned. And you, you have shared a lot of lessons this morning. Thank you very much. I only got started. I, only I believe got started. that. And it's time for us to sit at the feet of the elders and get our blessings. Yeah, I only got started. For any teachers in here, and I'm interrupting her before she finished, I'd like to share my book with you in your classroom in history or whatever the area that you feel you could I invite me you in. to my I, I, I'm coming I'll be there uh, passing the baton yes passing the baton to the future leaders of America which are the students in my class thank you that I struggle with every day thank you